Thomas Dimitrov, kind enough to uh, join us in studio. Thomas, always good to see you. Get close to that microphone. I think you know how this works. Yeah, Got to get close to it. I'm here. Thanks uh, for having me. Well, uh, again, this has been kind of a strange offseason or season in general for you. This is your first time without really being directly involved with a football organization in how long? Got uh, 30, no, more, 30 plus years yeah. probably, yeah. Lot, lots, lots of stuff going on, a lot of... A lot of different projects going on, but it's been crazy watching this cycle of the hiring of the GMs and the head coaches, which I'm sure we could talk about as well ad nauseum. Believe me, I've been on the phone with Dan quite a bit. I'm still a huge fan of Dan Quinn, and I think, you know, Dan did the right thing, by the way, if you want to talk about Cowboys and Quinn, because I think for him right now, staying put, uh, I think they're treating him well, and I think that's where he can continue to grow. Uh, what about you? I know that there was talk that you talked to Detroit last year late in the season after being fired uh, with the Falcons, for lack of a better term. Uh, any interest in getting back anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, I've kept my eye on it. Last year was an interesting episode as far as interviewing, going through that process. That happens. As you guys can see right now, there are very few uh, second-time GMs getting opportunities. It's one of the few places in the world in business that that happens. Most of us believe that we are exponentially better after – you know, potentially 13, 10, whatever years it is, and experiences, the bad experiences as well. We all know we can talk about those today. Those are real growing uh, moments. And going there to interview with Detroit, I was excited about it. But in the end, I knew it was not the best thing for me. I needed to be, I needed to step back, be around my children and my family, and really start contemplating what happened through all of those years of being here with the Falcons, quite honestly. So we've had a lot of conversations uh, over the years and certainly in the last year. And I will just say this now. There are no conditions today. I had people ask me, uh, what are you not going to be able to talk about? Nothing. I'm just going to tell you, we, we wouldn't have had you in here if there was any conditions at all. So the conversation is going to be what it's going to be. Everybody has their big boy pants on and, and we can go. The thing that's interesting to me is 13 years here. 13. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. you actually covered what I'll call the A to Z. And not a lot of guys get to have the highest of the high type moments and then the what the hell happened moments. Because you and were then the highest it. of the high again and then the lowest of the low again. Yeah. So it was a roller coaster ride. As a fan, you expect good and bad. What you hope for is exceptionally great, but with that might come the kick in the nuts type, type seasons or years or, or multiples. When you look back, if you're just going to. Describe your 13 years as quickly as you can, if, if, and I'm sure you've had time to reflect on it. How would you describe your 13 years of being here in Atlanta? Kicking the nuts. I love I can say that and not kicking the shins. I've been worried about that over the years. Yeah. Reality is it is a kick right there, and I look back on the 13 years. I look at the highs and I look at the lows. I look at the opportunity to come in after a four-win season prior to, you know, and after the Michael Vick debacle and build with Mike Smith. We build up to a spot where really one catch away from getting into the Super Bowl, and then we plummet, and then uh, obviously things go awry. Mike Smith was a damn good football coach. You all know that. Three coaches of the year during that stretch, really, really good, feeling really good about it, and then things started tailing off. We needed a replacement that was going to take the building and the team to another level. We have an opportunity to hire Dan Quinn. We, we, we mess around a little bit in that first year get to the Super Bowl in 16, stay strong coming off of a really horrendous loss. We all know that. And we're sitting there in 17 deep, too, too deep into the playoffs. But for some, you know, funky situations there down the stretch in that game, maybe we would have gone back feeling that rise and then feeling the plummet again. It's been the up literally and down. I say this to anyone. I am proud of the fact that I was able to be a part of rebuilding twice. If there's anything on my resume, it's not a Super Bowl winning GM. That hurts me, of course, and we can go into that. It's the fact that we put our heart and soul into this. I personally did. Unfortunately, it ends up in a, in a firing. Rich McKay, your friend and mine, of course, always comes up with some profundity, and his point was it never ends well. I'm not sure I was that happy to hear that from him when I got fired last year, but but that's the way it is. October 11th is the day you're 0-5. You and Dan Quinn both get it. Did you see the writing on the wall at that point, or did you think if this continues to go bad, at least I'm going to be the GM for the rest of the season? Nick, look, I, I really did. I thought that we were going to get through, and if, if there were to be, in fact, a move with Dan, I thought we were going to settle in and really try to take inventory of where we were. Uh, look, Arthur Blank and company, of course, they sat down and made a decision that it was best for the fan base and best for everyone that we do that. And that's where I was. It was a little unnerving, of course, like any time you get fired. But I realize it. I mean, I understand what they needed to do in Atlanta. And, you know, it was time. 
Thomas Dimitrov here in studio with us. And obviously we've talked about it on the air. Dan Quinn, certainly a lot of people point to him, but more so you're the villain when all is said and done. When you look at the salary cap situation now surrounding the Atlanta Falcons, what do you say to fans that point the finger at you? Well, look, I understand. I understand where it goes as a general manager. You're at the front of blame. No matter if the blame is yours, truly, inside the building, we all know so much more than everyone else because we're in the building, especially the co-team builders and the owner and the president. We know exactly what's gone on. Of course, you can't always talk about the minutia and the details of it. I would say, yes, it is. It is ultimately on me. And as a general manager, even if I wasn't given final... Final 53, which we all talked about when Dan came in, that was a big thing for me. I was still in charge of acquisitions. I was still in charge of the 90. Of course, as 53, just for expounding purposes, 53, as you know, means in the very end, if Dan and I disagreed on the 53rd player, a linebacker, it was his say. Someone has to have it. Dan and I never argued on 53, as I didn't with Mike Smith. But in the end, if I was vehemently opposed to something, it was in my contract where I could pound my fist on the table. When you start talking about salary cap first, because you brought that up in, in the discussion, I've heard it time and again. I understand that as well. I'm not happy that we ended up where we were, and I'm not happy that, you know, Terry Fontenot and company, again, were stepping into a situation. I'm very proud of living in Atlanta, my friendships in Atlanta. I love this city more than anything, and I want people to be proud of where we were and what we did. Of course, it didn't end well. On the salary cap side, when I look at that and thinking about being proud of what we did and our creativity over the years to get to where we got to, and then let's call it the way it is. This is not an excuse, Nick, but when you are faced with a situation when you're creative, and we did, we started in after the Super Bowl, remember this, that's when we started doing some restructurings. We didn't, we weren't a restructure team. And we started building up our restructures. We started banking on things. We project three and five years out. And then all of a sudden, again, not an excuse, but for everyone to know, $20 million drawback on the salary cap is a massive thing when you've been planning to be operating a certain way in the next three to five years. So that becomes complicated. As you know, let's, let's, talk, let's talk about this. You guys have heard you talk about the Saints. Well, the Saints, almost $70 million over. They're a really, Mickey Loomis is really good. I know a lot of people throw darts at him. No one here wants me to talk about how the Saints are good at what they do. So they're $70 million close over, over the cap. You have the, the, the um, Minnesota Vikings. Interestingly enough, Rick Spielman just got fired, of course. They are $45 million approximately over the cap, Nick. $45 million over the, the most reputable, um, financially sound team in our league. We look at Rob Brzezinski and people up at Minnesota, and we do not expect that, but they were in that situation. What I'm saying is just, just for everyone to take a deep breath, yes, I'll put my hands up. Ultimately, I'm not happy. We got creative. When in 16, we win the Super Well, excuse me, geez, that was a slip. We almost win we're the Super still Bowl. We're still thinking. Wait, what? Yeah, we almost win the Super Bowl. You, you understand as a GM and a head coach's Here team. Here come the build. hands. Everybody wants theirs. Everyone, everyone wants theirs, but also, but also you start looking at it as team builders and you're like, man, we need to keep this team together and let's go back and jam it down someone's throat in 17. We thought we could do that. Dan has such passion we were going to do it. We wanted to keep people together. We were still a young team. We won that, that, that NFC championship with a young football team in the spirit of it all and in the scope of it all. We wanted to keep it together, hence the moves. One of the problems is, though, if you don't hit on draft picks in a world where you're looking three to five out with the big ticket guys, now you got a real mess because not only are you chasing your tail for talent, but you're actually having to replace with money you don't have. The shuffle has now begun, and you and I have talked about it. The bill eventually comes due. That's what happens in this league. That, that's right. And that's where I step back and I, I think about how we approached every one of those moves over the years since 2008. And, you know, we could go over and we could go over everyone that were perceived as legit mix or misses. We can talk about that. That hurts me because I know what I put into it. And I did not want anything but the best for, of course, the fan base, of course, the Falcons, of course, for Arthur, because we were counting on building a perennial, well, very well respected team. And I thought we got to spots. But again, back to Nick's point, then we dropped. And what was this up and down element? And some of it has to do with salary cap. But. It has to do with other decisions made, of course, which we can talk about. Yeah. So let's let's do the couple of the draft picks. 
we talk all the time because it's the easiest one. If you get the quarterback wrong, you're chasing your tail. And that, that becomes a cycle that's really hard to get out of unless something falls in your lap. You get lucky uh, in some cases. When defensive ends twice over go wrong, now that's the other position. If you're chasing your tail at that spot, you might throw money at a veteran. That doesn't work out. Draft picks, I don't know what the hell we have here, but it's not what we drafted. Or it's not what we thought we drafted. Talk about, because it is TAC, it's Vic, uh, and it's quite honestly at some point bringing in a guy like Ray Edwards where you have to have something work, and if you, if you swing and miss on those, it's, it's tough to make up. In my self-evaluation recently, I have realized, first of all, think about this, two by-trade head coaches with defensive coordinator ability and top of their game. And when I look of the mistakes that were made personnel acquisition-wise, unfortunately, they were on defense. Of course, we can talk about Peter Kahn's and the draft in 12. But when you talk about, go back to what you're saying, yeah. all the way back to Smitty's regime, we go back to Ray Edwards. It wasn't a huge miss. It was nevertheless a, nevertheless a miss. And that wasn't a miss on the player. It was a miss on the person. When you fast forward to defensive players like, you know, Rashid Hegeman, a very good athlete. We didn't miss on the player's ability. We, again, missed on the person and their approach. And then we, we can jump into, you know, we can, we can jump into Vic Beasley if we go into, into uh, Dan's regime. I mean, Vic Beasley was one of the best athletes out there. He wins the SAC title, and then he plummets. The passion, unfortunately, was wavering. And I'm not saying Vic Beasley is a good person. That's not the point here. But when you're trying to evaluate the players and their makeup, and then, oh, by the way, you can go on to Tack McKinley, another fantastic athlete who could run like the wind and get up and around the corner and had all the things that not only the personnel staff, but the coaching staff were into. And then once again, it's a personality issue. Then, you know, you start looking at yourself. And last thing I think is very important to, to, to talk about here is when you're a general manager, ultimately, I do have final say on yay or nay. You're, you have to be the team builder, not only the team, the players. You have to work with your coaching staff. If your coaching staff and your personnel staff are you know, adamant about acquiring a certain player and their abilities, and they have been in the interview room, and they've coached them at the Senior Bowl, or they've been the D coordinator at UCLA, you know, we've had a lot of that. We're, we're going to count on that staff to hopefully move someone like Vic Beasley, who might have been average in his passion for the game, up to being, in our minds, we're projecting, because we're always projecting, up to being at least good in that department, which is going to carry you on for years, and you'll be able to sign double contracts for these kind of DNs. That's what we, of course, wanted. Thomas Dimitrov here in studio with us. Hindsight's always twenty twenty. It wasn't a restructure, but in retrospect, picking up that fifth year on Vic Beasley, was that a mistake? Hindsight, no question about it. And if, if, I, if you want a little bit of reasoning behind what we did, because I know everyone outside thinks, well, that's ridiculous. We knew where it was going. Why would you do that? First of all, we looked at it strongly. When you invest high in a, in a first-round pick like that, when that guy was the leader of the, of the uh, league in his ability and was, I mean, looked better and better every day you saw him. He was not a, he was not a partier. He, he was focused on keeping you know, body beautiful and all that. And then you start thinking about the dearth of pass rushers in the league. We weren't thinking we were going to get him in the draft. We thought we had a guy that we knew. We knew him. We knew his warts, and we were going to be able to continue to grow with him. We really thought, and ultimately I really thought, we have to go with this, and there's a chance that it falls apart, and it did. Can I – I want to go back to something. Getting it right on the talent, wrong on the person. I don't know how often that happens, but it, you see guys, you go – my God, that guy should have been in this league 12 years, and he's not. So stuff can happen. You can eat your way out, drink your way out, cook your way out, attitude your way out. You can do a lot of things. I don't know if this is a fair question, but does one hurt more than the other, getting talent wrong or getting the person wrong? Is there, as a GM, do you think one of those hurts more than the other? Well, yes, getting talent wrong for sure. I mean, I, was, I just did a whole uh, you know, walk around the country, so to speak, where I interviewed 16 of my contemporaries, spent hours and hours, and that was the overriding theme. Not one of those general managers think that they would not go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anyone in this league as far as evaluating talent. Most of us, that's why we're there. Mickey Loomis, of course, came in from a financial standpoint down in, in New Orleans. 
Howie Roseman up in Philly came as a legal guy. But most of us, by trade, in today's GM world, grew through evaluation. So there is no question that's what stings. When you miss on the person, that's where the, the precariousness of this profession really really, really, you know, it is tough for us to fathom. Think about this, gentlemen. Again, this is not me passing off to anyone. I ultimately am in charge of listening to everyone as a GM, going with my own understanding of what that player is, and then making the move. When you have, you know, 25 coaches on a staff, and you have almost as many scouts and personnel people, you have a lot of opinions that you have to work through. And on those days when you may disagree, it's up to you as a general manager to sift through countless reports and countless opinions and statistics on the player that you're acquiring. And, you know, I give, I, I give the way that the Braves approached everything, and, you know, one day hopefully we'll get on together. Um, but what they do and how they built that team I think is fantastic. Terry Fontenot is going to have to come in and, and look at all the mistakes that were made, like any building. The people that go into Minnesota, they're going to have to look at the mistakes on the people and decide whether they can keep those people, personality-wise, or whether they should move on. And that's not always an easy thing. Fresh starts are good sometimes. I'm really surprised, by the way, that Calvin Ridley might not stay with the Atlanta Falcons. Where is the people element of that acquisition? So that's something that's on my mind, and I'm watching closely. Thomas Dimitrov, uh, former GM of the Falcons, here in studio with us on the Fan 680 and 93.7 FM. Everybody knows about 28-3, to 3, and I've talked about this. This is like the Bill Buckner moment in Boston. Until the Falcons win a Super Bowl, it's never going to go away. In retrospect, did the team, I don't want to say did they fail because of that, but did that affect everything moving forward? Did they ever recover from that 28-3 to 3 debacle? So what I will say categorically for everyone to hear is we were not a piss-and-moan organization. You know that. That's not Dan Quinn. We got back in three days later. Everyone who, who thought that they needed to put their hand up in the meeting and say, look, that was my fault or I was part of that, that decision or whatever it was, that was talked about. No one, everyone, like, completely opened their breastplate. And we moved on from that. So when people say that and they think we were, you know, lulling around, getting complacent, getting, you know, you know just completely stung and we weren't thinking straight, it wasn't that. We honestly... If you look at our draft picks in some of those later years before we got fired, there were some good football players acquired. Maybe we weren't necessarily always uh, developing them into what we thought they were going to be as far as their potential. But we thought we were doing the right thing. The only thing that I think, you know, really starts happening is you start looking at the players. You start looking at some of the aging of the players, which will segue into probably your 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 ask about Julio Jones and spending money on some of the players like that. Oh, yeah, we're going to get there. Yeah. No, jump in, man. I'm, I'm waiting for that. I understand it. But what I'm saying is I think as far as decision-making, Nick, we started thinking about who was still hanging on, and we, and we would look around the league. And, and I think everyone needs to understand this. You don't just whimsically say, we're keeping this guy because we want it to look good on our, on our spreadsheet that we kept our draft picks. Hell no. We were about trying to make this organization the best and, and win again. And, and there's no question Dan Quinn, one of the most competitive people in the world, wanted that, as well as Arthur Blank. But we made some mistakes along the way by continuing to be with certain players that we thought still had one, two, or three years. Last thing I'll say, coming from the New England Patriots, I thought Bill Belichick was magical in the years of – Looking at players yeah. and knowing exactly when what, to get rid of them. What am I doing? I'm waving by. Before, before. A year too early as opposed to a year too late. That's right. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and it's funny. So I'm, I'm going to be, here's a really interesting insight for everyone and for you guys. I was all about that when I came in. I thought I am going to be, as much as I am not Bill Belichick and my style is not Bill Belichick, I was going to be Bill-like or a Belichickian in an approach to say, I wanted to be known for the guy who made those decisions a year earlier even if it was, you know, they got a little bit of production, that it was the right move. And the one we did, and the first one I did, we moved on from our center. We, we draft Peter Kahn's. And we, we move on from Todd McClure. Yeah. Todd was on the back end of his career, hands down. I did not personally research that enough with Matt Ryan, et cetera, about, all right, yes, he's on the tail end, but how important it was for Matt to have a veteran in front of him, and that affected us. And we made a mistake. I ultimately made a mistake on Peter Kahn's, who started a few games here and there and just fizzled out back to the person. Really good person. So but you get passion. gun shy about that approach then? Can one 
mistake in that regard, letting McClure go too soon? Do you overthink the next one or the one after that in that regard? You always, in that role as a team builder, you are, are using history as your guidepost. I can sit there and look at Bill Belichick's move, Andy Reid's moves, you know, um, Ernie Accorsi's move, but until you experience that as the guy in it, this is my world, this is Dan Quinn's world, I mean, I could talk about that with Dan, even some of our mistakes with Dan. Until he experienced some of those mistakes, I could have easily brought up Ray Edwards to Dan. But until Dan and I made a mistake in a similar situation, that was when we were together in our regime that we would really, you know, think about how we were approaching it. So there's no question. Yeah, uh, we'll get to the Julio thing in a second. I don't think, and I think this is the first time you've done anything really in Atlanta. You've done some podcasts and you've done some other stuff and, and there have been conversations off mic, but we get you in today. I think this is the first time in Atlanta. What's it, what is the night of the Super Bowl? What is the next day? What is whatever moment it might hit you? Because you do know as a Falcons fan, this idea that if my God, it's on the NFL network, I don't know what to do with myself. If somebody brings it up, let's do it's, this. It's a game not even involving the Falcons. Somebody will say 28, three and everybody around here gets, butt you know, butt crazy, and, and they can't figure out what the hell their emotion is supposed to be this many years later other than anger. Going back to your question uh, right before the break, a couple of days uh, after that Super Bowl loss. Yeah, and if you look back at what's different now, uh, then maybe we have a little bit more time where you, where you get a chance to, whatever the emotion is, whatever the hell the wave is, can you talk about what it's like early and then this much time later, what it's like to lose that game? We're still going back to 16, right? Yeah. That's where we're, we're – look – Yes, it never leaves me, and I will be honest with you, randomly I will text Arthur Blank and will lament on something that, I mean, look, Arthur obviously put his heart and soul into it. We can talk about Cap because, I mean, the one thing I was very fortunate about, I have a lot of contemporaries in this business who were forced to have 40-plus million dollar cap space. Arthur wanted truly to give back to this community, and that is not washing in any way, making it look gl glamorous and, and, and shiny for Arthur. That's what he believed in. Let's, let's spend the money on this team and get the right people. And it was about giving back. And I was fortunate. I, again, I continue to talk to people about that. So going into 16 and coming out of 16, we were given all resources needed. And that's what I've thought a lot about is I was given everything that I needed as far as financially, as far as um, as far as the the ability to make decisions with the co-team builder, i.e. the head coach. Um, that that was really, really fortunate for us. And I, and I do appreciate that. and will always appreciate it. Now, I will say, as I think about 16 and I think about that loss and I think about being a, an NFC champion uh, winning general manager versus a Super Bowl champion winning general manager, that kicks the crap out of me. And I think about it, every loss that I see, big loss, in any sport that I watch, I think about that, especially the championship games. And it brings me back to the gut-wrenching side. So. Did you, when it's sort of still fresh, do you tell yourself there's no doubt we're getting back to that game? And when we get back to that game, we're going to be better for it and we're going to win it. Does that, do you need that or is that part of the whole thought process too? Well, yes. I mean, look, after 16 and after a lot of those days spending together talking about every element of what happened and then not sure because I will say after 16 you never know you don't know if you're going to flail because is your head coach and your coaching staff and your players ready to take it on that's we see this you know the success rate is very low the fact that we were building and still playing legit football in 17 and got to the was it second round of the playoffs yes. against mm -hmm. Philly and and riding strong all the way through that I talked to Howie Roseman you know few months ago and he's like man i mean we i mean there were some of us that weren't sure if we you know you guys were on your way up to minnesota and, and obviously in the end they did a hell of a job and did what they did i started believing at that point we'll keep going after 17 i thought i was so damn mad that we went whatever we did in that whole down the stretch session down in the end zone what three three shots to julio whatever we don't need that, to dig uh, that, that up. That shovel pass, I don't yeah. know what that was right. either. Right, well, I, you know, but I looked and I was thinking, 17, man, we're, we're ready to go. Right. We showed that we are different than everyone else, and we weren't. Right. Not we weren't at that point going forward. We were. One I think we had the most conversations about in the last few years was Julio. So let's just put it on the table. Uh, the idea of ripping it up, redoing it. Ripping it up and redoing it. I don't know if the word regret, I don't know if, if you had a chance to do it again, if there was a thought process that I'm not aware of as to why that happened the way it did, and it seems like you're going to be throwing money at something that might not be worth it at that point. 
Okay, so think about this, and I and I was thinking a lot about this the other day because I someone had called me from Tennessee, and what he had a couple catches in that game, whatever it was, and I know his situation this year was very nebulous. When you draft someone as high as you do, this is not only as a general manager. This is general manager, but this is owner. This is, in our case, president. This is head coach and myself. We sit down and have you know discussions ad nauseum about the future of Julio Jones. Okay. We can talk about moving up as we did. He's a first ballot Hall of Famer. He does unbelievable. He had the best catch in the history of Super Bowls, and we didn't capitalize on it. Another time, another story, of course, the, the minutia of that. And then you still see him leading within the building in his own way, not an outspoken leader, but people, people I mean, revered him on our team, especially the, the skilled people. Everyone did. And you start thinking, okay, maybe he's tailing off a little bit. Maybe he has some you know, injury situations, but there is no one. And then, oh, by the way, from a business standpoint, exponentially more uh, decibel increase when he comes out of the tunnel than our star, Matt Ryan. We were very aware that I use that as an example, but we were very aware that he was the Atlanta Falcons. Yes, of course, Matt Ryan was, but Julio Jones was. So understand that there's a lot into that discussion, not just had some injuries and we we negotiated the year before remember yeah. to keep him in a good place that was ultimately my cho choice to do that people could argue that up and down i don't look at that one as being a major issue it was it was a handful of million dollars at the very least I mean, was it three million i think it was i i thought that was just a part of doing business to keep our guy who was the star of our team in the right place hindsight mm, the hindsight part comes into 22 million guaranteed element of it and where we were. Okay, as a general manager, after everything I've told you, sitting as an organization saying, we need this guy moving forward. We have a good three or four more years with him, we felt. That was our evaluation, whether you guys disagree or not. And we thought within time, like anything, within months or within a, a year, there's gonna be someone moving by him. He is categorically the best receiver in the country, albeit injuries, and he, he deserves to continue to be paid at the top of the market. Arthur Blank is always a top of the market person. With me, with Dan, with Rich McKay, whoever he's paying, top of the market in the sense of, tell me the top of the market, and we'll be right in that area. It doesn't always have to be the number one, but in, in this case with Julio, we decided Julio needed to be number one. So one of the things that leads to that is Matt's contract. When people talk about what it is as a cap hit, what it would be as dead money, I don't know if you choke as you start to look ahead because you're assuming you're still going to be in the job. Mm -hmm. When we hear and read numbers as fans and we go, wow, what are we handcuffed because of that number? What can't we do? It's not what we can do. It's what we can't do. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that contract and how it plays out where we, we're now in the 40s of millions of dollars when it comes to one position, one guy on an NFL team. Well, that's where we became, it became complicated for us. When you have Matt Ryan, who we weren't going to move on from, you see, I don't even think they're going to move on, you know, in, the, in a relatively near future. Who knows? That's, again, another topic, probably not my business anymore. When you look at it, and I remember we were in the process of negotiating that contract, and it was at, you know, 29 and a quarter and we're sitting there, and I'm not, believe me, I am not being so cavalier about money, but in our world and where we were going with quarterbacks, he was going to be the first $30 million quarterback. And then within a day, I'm being facetious, or a few days, and you see what happened. At our point, we saw, thought, this kid has done so much for this organization that that extra $750,000 a year over the next we were going to do that. We were not going anywhere but there. If we if we planned on cutting him, like some of the asinine comments, and I hope they're not your comments, about you know getting rid of Matt and bringing in a rookie and keep turning it over, there's that analytical talk about... <laughs> I'm, 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 no, yeah. I'm, I'm the guy who believes that unless you're the rare of the rare. I, I got crazy when it was, you got to pull, you get 20. You got to pull, you get 25. That's quarterback contracts all over the place. It, it made me insane, and I would right. at a certain point. I can't choke on that. I'm going to actually let you go, and I'm going to try it again with somebody else. Only because in a cap-driven world, if I get this wrong and if I give them too much, there are things that I'm not going to be able to put around them. Right. So I do believe, again, there are rare exceptions. I don't know if Matt's a rare exception, but I'm, I'm flipping it. Well, obviously, well, I'm you starting thought he was. Well, yeah, that, that's a really good point, Nick. Yeah, we thought, I ultimately thought he was for another few years. We had, we were, we had momentum. Now, I said recently on, on Ari's uh, um, podcast, 
the guy up in New York City through PFF, I had mentioned in today's world, not back then, I would be very driven towards pulling a versatile athletic quarterback. I'm not talking about necessarily a 5'11 guy. I'm talking about the cats that are out there right now. We've seen them. We can talk San Diego or San Diego. We can talk. We can talk Chargers. to Chargers. We Buffalo. can talk Buffalo. We can talk. You know, we can talk Kansas City. We can talk all those guys and what they do. And I know we can talk all about the statistics of not winning yet. Yeah. They're on their way to winning big in this league. And to have that stand tall guy in the pocket, it's it's right now cyclical, but it's it's on its way in a different spot. So. Look, I would say back to Matt Ryan, I would never have done that differently. And I'm sorry if your fans aren't happy to hear that. I think you can win a Super Bowl with Matt Ryan. I do believe you can, can still. That means getting a damn good running game. That means making sure that you have your O-line and everything operating in the right way. You can't go in having one of your star receivers taking over for Julio, dropping off the face of the earth, and using a number three. I'll do respect to him, to Gage. He's a number three in the league. And he ends up being your number one. That's but if you have, well, I think you saw that with Brady in the playoff game. There yes. was no comfort zone with yeah. any of those. But, but if you have a wide receiver and a quarterback, again, in the cap world, this is me, you have to get so many of the draft picks right. You have to because I don't have the money to go pay. Well, going back to the running the mistake. game as well, we talk about Julio, we talk about Matt Ryan. The one I didn't agree with, and I think we've talked about this, was Devontae Freeman. Any regrets there because I would have let him walk. Yeah, no, that's one that – if I could have back and remember, it was really odd how that was taken care of. And, and his agent was a, a one-time agent. And remember, we were literally walking on the bus, going out to practice in the Super Bowl. I don't know. Was it the middle of the week? Yes, it yeah. was. And and that those yeah. quotes hit. We were blown away. I was, I was, I was more blown away because I knew what De- Devontae was as far as, you know, um, as a person and as a, as a teammate. And yet it started to shed some light thinking, wow, did, did I have that wrong? And yet... You know, that was one after the season. We started looking at it. And, and look, again, it is ultimately me. It's my mistake, everyone. Understand that. However, there's a lot of discussion. It's not just me saying, oh, I like the guy. I love the high fives he gives me. And he can he runs hard and we're going we're gonna to sign him. We start thinking about it. We start thinking about the run game, thinking we're going to take our run game to another level. We just got into the Super Bowl. Now he messed part of messing up on it, right? His pass protection on that, that was tough. But we forgive those kind of things. I thought that he was going to be a, a cornerstone of a run game that was going to help Matt progress, evolve into what we were hoping as he aged. It was the wrong move. Now, in retrospect, you talk about that Super Bowl and you talk about lamenting things and texting Arthur Blank. What are the one or two things that stick in your craw more so than anything else? Through, I'm sorry, Nick, through what? When you look back at how that thing unraveled, the end of the Super Bowl loss. The things that stick in my craw, quite honestly, were, you know, the fact that we were in a spot where our head coach was calling the defense. And, you know, I think, and, and people can disagree how they want, I think Dan is a damn good coach and a damn good leader. When you're a damn good coach and a damn good leader, and you're also calling the defense or offense, it takes away from your damn good leadership and damn good coaching. That's personally what I believe. He relied and rightly so, relied on, you know, Kyle Shanahan, who was a damn good coach and who knew what he was doing, and he relied on that. And he knew that if there was one person that knew that offense, it was going to be, you know, our offensive coordinator. And I know Kyle's been talking about it, and he's talked at nauseum about it, ad nauseum about it, I get it. That's in my cross sometimes because in the end, run, 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 kick doesn't seem like it's that complicated. And what was that and why was that? You know, that's that's something that is is tough for me to take. Is that a guy being smarter than the room or is that ego or is that just trusting what he's done all along? Well, probably can say a little bit of everything for all of us. Right. He's he's a highly competitive guy and we can all be putting ourselves in that spot and say it may be a little bit. But in the end, Nick's comment there is, yeah, I think it's like, hey, man. We have studs, i.e. Julio. We have what we had around there, and we're going to use those guys. And, you know, the, the whole idea of thinking, well, let's just keep with what got us here. That's tough for me. I want to go back to whether you have an offensive guy or a defensive guy. You said earlier it's really tough, especially a young guy, if you're really calling one side of the football. If that's your thing and you're still trying to be a leader of the Because he took over the, the defense thing, that year, right? I think after and the Kansas City game. He if took you over were hiring a head coach, would you want somebody to play the role of headsets on, no, we're going to run it three times, as opposed to the guy who's working the defense. 
when this is actually happening? Do you believe the evolution of the head coach is be the head coach, have the headsets on? When you realize we're going to pass the ball, no, we're not. Is that sort of something that probably needs to be addressed with, with a head guy on a football team? Okay, you know, I look at, you know, the, the 13 years of being in the, in the GM role and being around two really good football coaches and Mike and Dan, very adept at a lot of different levels. They had, of course, their challenges in other levels. We, we all do it, whatever we do. Leading into that, I step back now and I realize what I love is that head coach with a damn presence. And they both had a presence, a presence where they were running it from here. Big picture. This isn't about Dan getting into Kyle Shanahan's ear or Sarkeesian's ear or even Dirk Cutter's ear. Necessarily go, need to go there. And we end, up, um, we end up looking at that and we say, it's not about the exact play. It's about, I want to go deep five times. I want to go underneath. I want to screen the damn ball. And I want to jam it down their throats. That's what I want personally from a head coach, if, if I were to give my, my spiel on it. Take, take damn control of all of that. Don't worry and I'm not saying Dan worried mm-hmm. about it. any coach. Let's just say. Well, at least bleed the clock, if nothing else. The yeah, clock is your bleed, friend bleed in that clock. situation. Bleed the clock. Own own it and be who you are as the head of it all. And, and all, oh, by the way, don't worry about offending your offensive coordinator, your, your receiver coach, or your running back coach. You know what? I can look at coaches like Sean Payton, and I, I know in the past he's probably rubbed his coaches. Bill Belichick has. Nick Saban has. You know, of course, all of the great ones. They get to a point, as you know, they're not worried about offending them. And quite honestly, they're looking across the table like we have right now, and they're saying, if you don't like it, you know, screw it then. Take off. We don't need you. That's how strong some of those coaches are. They can still be the right coaches and the right morale coaches, Nick, but when it comes to, to push, there's no question. They're, they're not hesitant about it. And that's was Dan hesitant in that situation, do you think? I don't believe Dan w- was a hesitant guy in that way. He had a lot of coaches around him who were experienced coaches. And in today's world, head coaches, no question, want their loyalists around them. And he had, I mean, I'm telling you, per coaching, there were some really good coaches on that staff. Dan is a very mindful guy of making sure that his staff is, is collaborative and cohesive, which I think anyone is. I think even the guys that get into those coaches, i.e. Like, Bill Belichick, Nick Saban's, you know, cross sport, uh, Popovich probably, they're aware of it. But I, I think there are certain guys that their personalities are more positive, upbeat, passionate. That was Dan. Dan was not going to go in there and run those guys ragged and they go out and they weren't, you know, moving out with the players and they were dragging their dauber. And all of a sudden, Dan's, Dan's doing what he said he didn't want to do and he's getting his coaches down. And then his coaches are staying down when they get on the field and then there's no passion and fire. Mm-hmm. You have to understand that. That's really important. Well, I remember the one thing you told us when you guys were going on the Super Bowl run, the Dan Quinn that you see in front of the camera, and we figured this out over the years, haven't talked to him, you know, off the record. He's the same guy behind the scenes. He's always going to be upbeat and positive. He's, he's an upbeat and positive guy. Sometimes but, that works against you, though. Sure. No, look, I mean, I mean, he came from one of the ultimate upbeat guys in Pete Carroll. I mean, you, you are who you are around. Now, you start to evolve when you get into that spot. There were elements of Dan Quinn when he came from Seattle early on that were definitely a uh, smacked of Pete Carroll-esque approach. And then, you know, quickly some of those things fade away and you find your own spot. I mean, that, that is very natural. And I, I, I do believe that ultimately, you know, that coaching situation is something that we could talk forever about. Because if your coaching situation, and I'm not just talking about yours, I am talking about your coordinators. That is massively important. I'm also talking about in today's world, there is too much cashing out. It's about the coordinators. Remember, everyone, when you have all of these position coaches, this was probably a really unknown fact. The position coaches are responsible for, for substitution, not the offensive coordinator. You can, people can throw darts at Dirk all they want, Dirk Cutter and whoever. Dirk Cutter was not responsible for putting our talented people in. Our receiver coach was. Our DN coach was. So if you don't have an adept assistant coach, some of those guys are really good coaches on the field, and they may develop. They may be good at scheme, Nick. But when it comes to substitution, they lose their minds, and all of a sudden, our best players might not be on the field. If you have a guy in front of the entire organization, he's in charge of the biggest room in the building, I think, especially with grown men, they smell BS. You know, you talk about, is Dan who he was? Yeah, you better be, because 
the grown men who are playing are going to smell it if it's not. The guys who have been in the league are going to smell it if it's not. And I do think the idea that you have to red light it, once the red light goes on, you better be somebody different, it doesn't work anymore. Be, guys are more adept at actually figuring it out. I want to ask you something about how many years in and around the NFL? Me? Yeah. 28. Okay. So when you're 30 years in, do you understand the fan angst? And I'm not saying that you don't have it yourself. you got to hear it in the community. you got kids. Yeah. All that stuff. But do you get away from understanding why this means so much to people? Why the anger? Why the highs are the highs? The building is whipped up into a frenzy. we got a good football team, and, yeah, we're going to go kick someone's ass eight times this year in this building. Then the lows are the lows. Can you appreciate or understand the fan part of all of this when you've been in the league for 30 years? No question whatsoever. And you have to remember, honestly, Chris, Nicola attests to this. I was a Cleveland Brown fan in the in the 90s, you know, or excuse me, the 80s and 90s during during those times. Of course, my dad worked for them, but I was having been around some of the heartache in sport. That is a big thing. 100 percent understand. That's why I came here thinking I wanted nothing more than to build. And when we were building with Smitty, I was very proud of being able to bring that a part of it, be, be do my part in bringing, you know, a legit respected franchise that people around the league, our contemporaries, were really uh, outspoken about how we were approaching things. That was big for me, and I, and, I, and I was proud for not only us, of course, I was proud for the Atlanta fans that would walk into cities around the country or even over in London with a Falcons jersey and feel proud. That is a big thing. I have some of my best friends, my fiancé, family-to-be. They are through and through Atlanta people, and I get it, and I want everyone to know it, it, it hurt like hell to think that I was going to end the way we ended last year because that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to rebuild the damn thing again and say, okay, we are the resilient people that we can carry that, that, that torch to say 100% or the flag or whatever it is that we are a resilient group, and I didn't do my part ultimately as a GM, and it hurts like hell to think about that. And look... One of the things that I've talked to you before about, Chris, is as an organization, um, you're talking about how it affects me. I wanted nothing more. And I've said this time again, I would have loved to have got in front of an entire stadium with all of our best fans and truly express everything that happened as much as I could, because that is important to me. I am a communicator. I am not one of those guys, whether you guys saw it a certain way, where I was kind of hemmed in and put put into a into a room aside from you guys when you're looking to get the interviews and the and the fan base was looking to hear from Thomas Dimitrov and insinuating that I was cowering that bothered the hell out of me because that is not me at the core anyone who knows me is it's not me as an organization remember this a GM does not determine the policy of media and interaction with the fan base Ultimately, there are a lot of people, as you know, in today's NFL, this is different than back in the day when George Young was running the Giants and, 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 and um, uh, Mr. Wolf, you know, uh, um, at, Ron Wolf, at, yeah, Ron Green, Wolf Bay. at Green Bay and Ernie Acorsi slamming the, the fists on the table. This is a different thing. You have to be collaborative. You have an owner. I mean, look, two really important people in Arthur's, in Arthur's quiver, i.e. Kim Schreckengoss back in the days of Mike Smith as the media head and now Brett Jukes, they ultimately, very smart people and good at what they do, determine what Arthur should do with his team as far as having a GM go out there. Ideally, I would have personally liked to be available weekly, but that's not what we chose to do. And, and at times when I sit back, I wish that I had the opportunity to express more along the way. Not necessarily a call-in, but I would love to have, have been able to do that. Yeah, and the idea that, by the way, I think what happens is, and we think about this with players, why does it look like that guy doesn't care as much as the guy who just bought two tickets to bring him and his kid down? And whether it's perceived or not, that concept of they don't seem to get it. Sometimes perception becomes reality. A lot of times it does, in fact. Right. Well, look, I can tell you, I don't think there are many people, at least the people that I've been around in the organizations, Mike Smith was one of the most competitive. You all remember when he wanted to kick uh, D'Angelo Hall's butt. I remember that. He was fighting him on the sideline. In my honor, would, by the way, I laughed at that. He would get all red. He would That's get all red. Yeah. Dan Quinn, you, you, let's just go to that for a second. Yeah. Dan Quinn has some jersey to him. You know that Midwest, Northeast. Dan, don't let, don't let people think that Dan never bowed, bowed up. I mean, he was a tough-ass guy, man. He has that side to him. He just believes in keeping it as positive as he thinks is necessary. That's important for people to, to, to yeah, know. We saw it in Hard Knocks. We were very surprised that Hard Knocks caught him... Well, working blue. Blue, yeah. 
Do, do, do you know? Do <laughs> you lack believe? Of a better this? term. Do you believe? You mentioned the George Youngs and the fist on the table. And this is how it's going to go. And a lot of us, if you're old enough, you grew up and you thought that's what the job is. Do you believe your age when it was early on? Do you believe, you know, not being this guy? Because that's not necessarily the way you're going to win in the modern version of the NFL. Do you think that also hurts? Do you think that people say, oh, Thomas, he came from this, and he looks like this, and he rides a bike, and all those things that people can just sort of go, yeah, you know what I want? And I'll say it. I, every once in a while, I want somebody in my, in my organization, the team I root for, to flip three tables, not flip one. I want somebody to be pissed off. I want somebody to come out and say they're pissed off. It's not acceptable. Is that what you're also talking about when you don't feel like you get enough of a chance to do that? Uh, yes. And again, in today's world, you're, that's why one of the, you know, it's a, it's a big topic right now, why they're hiring all the guys at the same age I re- really got hired, right? At mm-hmm. 41, they're going into organizations. They don't have cachet. They've never led a team before. And oh, by the way, they have never even had formal training to lead. None of us have. We might have been captains on our respective teams. Now we're leading an organization that's worth three billion, four, whatever. That's a big deal. And, and learning on the fly is a really important thing. When you come into the league now and you come in as a GM and you hear people saying, I want the empathic guy. Yes, the, the emotionally intelligent GM is important to have an edge and to be able to to stand up w- and, and fight for what you believe in is one thing. And I I say this categorically. I never had a problem doing that. Ultimately, however, it is important to make sure that your relationship with your head coach as a team builder is intact. You'll never survive in this industry with an acrimonious relationship with your head coach you it doesn't happen you can go all the way back to um uh you can go back to the the chargers back in san diego with aj smith who was a great football man and marty schottenheimer that's what used to stick in my craw i'm like these two guys are killer football people but their egos are at a point where they would fight each other all the time it went awry and if you see any of them ryan grigson up in indianapolis ryan is a really good general manager with a great eye he lasted four years with Pagano and, and, and et al. or whatever with company, you know, in that group. And he can't get back in because he's known for being the rub the wrong way guy, right? Scott Pioli. Scott is a really good person he, um, and a good football man. But Scott's reputation for being rough and grumble and to the point about it doesn't work for certain people. But he should be a GM in this league right now. That's what we know. But there's people that are backing up. It is a different world now. Whether we like it or not, it is a different world. We know that from from what's going on across the board. I think we got some insight into the question we're going to ask. But before we let you go, if you get another chance, what would you do different this time around? Well, I think one of the things that I've said to people is, first of all, and by the way, if I could say to any owner out there, respectfully, if they did ask me my advice, going in the door, and, and this is not soft at all, Get your executives, i.e. your GM, your young GM, and your young head coach, where appropriate, get them the right coaching, the right leadership skills where it's more, it is more today than just going in, having captained your basketball team in high school. You have to start off. Don't wait until the 10th and 11th year when things are going awry to necessarily get your people coaching and, and work on how they're leading the team and keeping the morale. That is something I would say to any owner for sure. Arthur was great putting money into the building in that way. That's a really important thing for an owner, which segues into what would I do differently? I would sit down in that interview with that owner and I would be extremely candid about what I needed as a general manager and what I expected and what my mistakes were where I was, i.e. here. And I would talk exactly about what I learned from those mistakes. And I would say categorically, again, categorically, that if I don't have this, I don't care what kind of money you're throwing out to this contract, I'm not doing it. Remember, when you're a first time GM, you are acquiescent beyond, right? You're like, yes, sir, yes, sir. That's what happens to your point. You come back in as a 48 year old or a 55 year old, whatever it is with, with pelts on your walls, good and bad pelts. I don't, maybe you can have good and bad pelts. And, and you realize what you've done wrong. I would go in looking at everything that I had done wrong, whether it was salary cap related, acquisition related, uh, related, what we talked about earlier, player related versus person related. That was a big thing. So, I mean, I'm, if I could talk about it in, in one, I think it's really going in not next time, not concerning myself as much about the camaraderie of the team and the collaboration as much as these are my strong opinions. I hope you like it. Keep me on board and I will get us to being a championship caliber football team because I believe that we can do that. But we have to do it 
this way, A, B, and C, and X, Y, and Z. If you don't like it, don't hire me. Well, you also better be prepared to openly talk about, because in any good interview, what happened here, what happened here. And if, if really? I'm the guy interviewing you and I don't think you've actually thought about it, there's red flag after red flag. It sounds like you do know that you better self-assess before you even think about getting back into anything like this. that is this is not an exact science not only acquisition but the right decisions we all know that and if you can't be a self-evaluator and you can't look yourself in the mirror and realize your mistakes I would personally I would love to go into an interview honestly Nick with a with a with an owner and go down the line let's go down every one of my uh, uh, ostensible mistakes and I will talk to you about them I will tell I will talk about the Mia Culpas I'll talk about where the mistakes were I'll give you background on why we did it like I said today, in all of this, not one iota of excuse, but there is background on every decision you make. We weren't a whimsical organization. It starts from Arthur. He's not whimsical. Rich McKay is not whimsical. Our, you know, Steve Cannon on the business side, these are really intelligent, thought-out people. And our building was thought out, contrary to what everyone knows. And understand, last thing for your fan base, they bled it. And they, there was so much passion within that building. And I know out walking around, it might not seem like that, but I could put my hand on whatever the proverbial book is and, 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 and say 100% that was the Atlanta Falcons during the 8th to the 13th.